is my part a good fit for MIM? That's a, a great uh, place to start out. Uh, we have seven considerations here. Uh, the first one is uh, annual quantity. Uh, MIM is uh, really economical for quantities around 10K up into the millions. And it's important to note that the process can scale very quickly with the addition of tooling cavities. Uh, next, uh, the second one is the part size. MIM works well for parts uh, the size of a grain of rice up to about the size of a baseball. That's where, uh, that's where it's most economical. Uh, if you, the part you're considering is outside of those uh, bounds, um, it's still, uh, still a possibility. The, the process doesn't have any uh, hard cutoffs as far as size. Uh, next, uh, the, uh, the third one is material. Uh, is the part that you're considering uh, needed in a standard MIM material, or would it require some custom alloy development? Uh, the fourth consideration is uh, what types of secondary operations might be needed. And it, it's good to know that uh, operations like plating and tapping, heat treatment, uh, subassembly, CNC machining, coining and sizing are all secondary operations that can be applied to MIM parts if needed. Of course, the ideal is a near net shaped part that doesn't require any secondaries. Uh, that's uh, th that's the best value. So that's what we that's what we try for. The fifth consideration is what's the part application? That's kind of an open-ended question, uh, but it uh, it leads us to consider um, what types of properties the part needs. Does it need good corrosion resistance? Does it need uh, uh, very good mechanical properties? Um, are there regulatory considerations? So. All of those are, are good to think about up front. Then uh, the sixth uh, one is the program life. Um, it, it's important uh, because of uh, the tooling that's needed, uh, it's important to have a program life that will give you a good return on your investment. Uh, seventh is uh, cosmetic requirements. Uh, because metal injection molding is an injection molding process, uh, there are features on parts like uh, gate witnesses, parting lines, ejector pin witnesses, and uh, and things like that. And uh, we always work with customers to uh, to come up with a design that best fits their their needs and uh, and configures those features in a way that's uh, that's best for the part application. Uh, finally, surface finish uh, is usually very good with MIM, and it can be improved even further through secondary operations. Now, this graphic uh, shows where MIM uh, competes in the marketplace, uh, where, uh, where it's best applied. You can see the y-axis there is part volume, uh, it's annual volume, and then along the bottom is part size in ounces. And you can see that MIM occupies that upper left quadrant. Uh, in the higher volumes, uh, MIM is, uh, is best suited uh, as a high volume process. And then as you go to the right, uh, you can see that there's a point where MIM uh, doesn't compete very well because of uh, part size. Uh, the, the centering time and the material cost tend to outweigh uh, the value when we get to that point. Investment casting takes over as a, a good technology for heavier parts. And then you can see uh, machining is, uh, is there at the lower volumes and tends to be an economical uh, manufacturing method at the, the lower volumes and through all part sizes. So is MIM right for you? This uh, slide has some other uh, competing technologies that uh, that we consider when we're uh, looking at MIM. Uh, the first one there in the upper left uh, of this slide is plastics. Uh, if your part uh, can uh, can tolerate the the properties of a plastic, then that's probably the the best value. And so, uh, 
if if plastic will work, uh, MIM probably isn't needed. However, if if performance requirements are more than what plastic can provide, then MIM is probably a good option. Next one, number two, is conventional PM or powder metallurgy. Uh, that competes with MIM as well, but it has limitations. Uh, the parts that you can get from conventional PM are more two-dimensional. Uh, they can be machined to add features, but that also adds cost. And then because of uh, the material and the sintering temperatures, uh, the densities are not as high as MIM, and so mechanical properties aren't, uh, aren't quite as, as high as with MIM parts. So if properties and geometry are a consideration, uh, then MIM looks pretty good uh, as an alternative here as well. Uh, next, uh, number three, is stamping and fine blanking. And some of the same, uh, the same considerations apply as with conventional PM uh, properties. Uh, are generally not quite as good as MIM. And then also, uh, geometry limitations are, are sometimes uh, something that would make you go with, uh, with MIM as well. And then up at the, the top right is uh, investment casting and die casting. Those are lumped together. Those are both also injection molded uh, processes, at least uh, sub-processes there. And uh, they compete uh, with MIM as well. Uh, however, uh, MIM properties uh, slightly edge out investment casting and uh, in the higher volumes uh, can also uh, possibly be a bet better value. Um, die casting can, can be a better value than MIM. Uh, if uh, properties of uh, a non-ferrous alloy are acceptable, if you need uh, properties of a ferrous alloy, then then MIM is probably the best option. And then number five, uh, geometry considerations. And we've talked about this a little bit. Uh, MIM is good for highly complex parts, and uh, some geometries are just not manufacturable by any of the process, or not economically manufacturable by, uh, is maybe a better way to put it. Uh, number six is machining costs. Uh, if um, if a, a uh, park requires multiple setups and if there are capacity considerations, then MIM might be the, the better option there as well. So let's talk a little bit about the, the MIM process in detail. We say that MIM is a hybrid technology, and uh, it's called that because it combines plastic injection molding and powder metallurgy. Those are the two main sub-processes that, uh, that make up MIM technology. Uh, the feedstock used is a mixture of metal powder and a binder that's made up of plastic and paraffin wax. Uh, the MIM process produces precise, complex parts and in large quantities. That's the, the hallmark of the MIM process. Now, here's a, a graphic showing uh, the MIM process steps. You can see the first step is the powder atomization, where the, the powder is created and classified. That's done at an outside supplier. Step two, the powder is compounded into feedstock, and that's done in-house here at Optimum. The third step is injection molding, where parts are molded into the, the part geometry uh, using a, an injection mold and a plastic injection molder. Uh, that's that's been uh, modified for use with MIM. And then step four is the debind process where the plastic and wax binders are removed. Then step five, the parts are sintered. They're brought to within uh, one or 200 degrees of the melting point and densified. And then six is the final product, the, the finished sintered part. Now here's a look at uh, the different stages that the parts go through after they're, after they're molded. Uh, we start there on the left with a green part, which is uh, the metal powder and binder holding it all together. And the next step there with the arrow is the debind process. And the parts shrink about 2% at this stage. And then we get what's called a brown part. 
the parts generally aren't uh, actually brown, but they're different from the, the and then uh, they go through the sintering operation, and parts shrink anywhere from 16 to 22 percent, and then you end up with the finished sintered part. Now let's look at another short two-minute video. Uh, this video goes through the, the steps of the process in a little bit more detail, and uh, you'll get a look at, at uh, what each of those process steps looks like. Metal injection molding, or MIM, has a well-deserved reputation for delivering the highest performing small precision parts in the metal forming industry. Its secret? MIM's unique production process. This achieves significantly higher density than anything possible with standard powdered metallurgy. It starts when superfine metal powders are combined with a primary paraffin wax material and a secondary thermoplastic polymer. The resulting mixture is extruded and chopped into tiny pellets. These are heated before being injected into a mold cavity under high pressure. It is a technique that delivers tighter, net-shaped tolerances over high production runs, making it possible to produce extremely complex components with enhanced surface finishes. Once molded, the component, what we call a green part, has an identical geometry to the finished part, but is about 20% larger. This allows for shrinkage later in the process. The part is then put into a furnace to remove most of the binders during the debinding process. At this point, it is referred to as a brown part. In the final stage, sintering heats the component to temperatures near the melting point of its metal. This eliminates the remaining binder and gives the part its final geometry and strength. The result? High precision parts delivering world leading strength, corrosion resistance and density. Optimum. When only the best will do. Okay. Well, that's, that's a little bit more detailed look at the process. Let's talk about uh, some of the important tools that, that go into some of those process steps. Uh, the first one is in-house feedstock compounding. This is a really important component of, of the MIM process at, at Optimum. Um, and as you can see there in the first box, that first point, uh, we like to think of it as the foundation of the MIM process. It, it has a, a really significant effect on the final quality of the part. So. Uh, we we pay the the feedstock a lot of attention uh, because we compound the feedstock. We specify uh, all of the the powder properties uh, that we source. Uh, it gives us internal control of all the variables that go into the feedstock, and that's important in uh, ensuring the consistency of of the finished parts. Uh, the particle size distribution is important in that and a lot of other factors as well. Uh, after the compounding, uh, the feedstock is 100% tested and certified, and we maintain material traceability all the way from uh, raw material receipt through, through the production parts. So we know exactly what's gone into to every part that we produce. And it also gives us the ability to create new alloys and to, to tailor feedstock to specific needs. Uh, one of the ways, uh, the, or I should say one of the benefits of that is that we can match the shrinkage of different materials. Uh, we've had a case where a particular component needed to switch from 17.4 pH uh, to 420 stainless steel. And that was possible because we were able to match the shrink factors of those two different materials. And then also, it's possible to match the shrinkage uh, to existing tooling uh, for a tool that's been built uh, with a shrink factor for a different uh, type of feedstock. We can generally match uh, the feedstock to that uh, existing tool's shrink factor. And then finally, uh, being able to blend uh, feedstock in-house also gives you uh, a greater material selection and allows uh, production of, of more materials. So another tool in our toolkit uh, during part development is a predictive model uh, to uh, estimate our, 
our capability on uh, finished parts and uh, and their tolerance capability. Uh, we start out with uh, a print from a customer with specific uh, tolerances and specifications, and our model tells us uh, how capable we'll be at, at particular tolerances. Uh, if there are, are any issues, uh, those can be negotiated, or there are ways to uh, adapt uh, certain elements of the process in order to uh, to meet those tolerances. Perhaps it's the addition of a, a secondary uh, operation or uh, some specific uh, components of the tool design that, that could be modified. But the important thing is to know that before the tool is fabricated. Uh, one of the other things uh, that's done as, as part of uh, initial development steps are running mold flow simulations in the mold cavities. And this tells us if there are any potential uh, trouble points. And again, those can be addressed right up front before the tool is, is ever designed or fabricated. And then uh, when it comes to production, uh, another important uh, tool in the arsenal is our state-of-the-art molding process control. And uh, it's, it's not just process control, but process control and monitoring. And, uh, and the control is achieved through uh, feedback loops, which can actually uh, tune the process uh, using sensors that measure cavity pressure. And, and then the, uh, the monitoring portion uh, is uh, also done with the pressure sensors, and they can detect if any parts go out of specification, if any one of the cavities, and I should mention that this technology is generally used for uh, multiple cavity tools, but it can detect whether any of the cavities has experienced an anomaly during the fill cycle, and our automated uh, extraction machinery can automatically reject any component that's outside of specification. Uh, it's just dropped in the recycling bin uh, for regrinding and use in, uh, in later shops. 